What's wrong with tower climbing uh, training program? Stay tuned. Today we're going to look at the evolution of tower climbing training and certification programs with one of the industry leading uh, trainers. But first, let's hear Thinking beyond today's technology to help you make the best decision for your network and your business. Telecom Careers, the number one global telecom and wireless job board. Telecomcareers.com. All right. Thank you for joining us today. Over the past couple of weeks on Inside Telecom Careers, I've spoken to Hugh O'Kane, who is CEO of Kane Electric, and uh, also Don Bach, who is Vice President of Operations and Engineering for SAC Wireless. And they've identified a couple key roles. Uh, firstly, tower climbers. Secondly, tower splicers who have experience working in confined space. Um, thirdly, right away inside acquisition specialists. And finally, program managers or project managers. Today, we're going to focus on the tower climber industry while laying the foundation for future programs that will get into the outside plant and fiber splicing as well as NFE and virtualization. Today, we're very fortunate to have a great guest. Um, J.P. Jones, who's Vice President of Tower Safety, uh, or Safety LMS, I'm sorry. Uh, J.P., thanks for joining us today. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Well, um, you're at the top of a mountain somewhere in Colorado, so tell us a little bit about what you're doing today. I am actually in uh, our Warriors for Wireless Grand Junction, uh, Colorado training facility, and we're at uh, day three of an 11-day program that we put these guys through. So, I'm actually in the uh, middle of teaching an authorized climber, authorized rescuer course at this time. Well, uh, my opening question was, uh, you know, what's wrong with tower training programs today? And uh, I'd like our production team to maybe bring up our our first slide that um, has some of the uh, the trends I just mentioned. Um, uh, first and foremost, the uh, from a tower climber standpoint, what we're seeing at RCR Wireless is uh, a real focus in the industry on, on safety, a real focus on standards, and um, finally, a, a focus on workforce development. Um, from, from your opinion, from your standpoint, um, you know, is the tower industry and the, the training keeping up with these trends? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always faced with uh, the challenge of, of properly training the workforce. Uh, the trend that seems to have always been in the industry, and I've been in it since 1979, is that we have peaks and valleys in the industry. As technology evolves, uh, new antenna systems, better uh, methods of producing and, and transmitting the data that we need, uh, it has a, an evolution of highs and lows. So right now we're in the process of moving toward 5G, uh, the industry's a little bit on the slow side right now. As that happens, uh, obviously the workforce is a little bit slower, therefore the accidents fall off and uh, the industry gets kind of uh, some of the statistics lull us into believing that we're operating at a safer pace and we're really not. We're just not producing as much work. We don't have as many workers in the in the field as we normally do. As those things increase, uh, when you look into, you know, 2G and things like that, uh, 2006, we had 19 accidents, 19 fatalities in one year. Uh, we are moving toward that again in 5G. So we've got to really stay focused on how uh, we train these workers. And um, the unfortunate part is we, we always end up with a new, fresh workforce, a lot of new guys coming in, a lot of young, untrained workers. And uh, we've got to be really diligent about uh, – properly training these guys and uh, giving them the ability to work in a safe workplace. Got it. Well, JP, what I'd like the production team to do next is bring up the second slide, uh, which has a summary of what I would say some of the existing training programs. Many of these I pulled from Safety LMS website. Um, uh, you know, it's the, it's the basic tower climber training and some other things. Why don't you walk us through maybe a snapshot of the training programs that exist today and Feel free to mention some of the, the you mentioned eleven day program that's going on this week with wireless for uh, workers warriors for wireless. But uh, tell us where we are today and what programs are offered. You know we're uh, we're at a point now to where we really have some great 
uh, programs. We've moved away from the uh, requirement of just having a tower climber card in our pocket. Uh, we need to have more specific training. Uh, we start off with our with our new guys as authorized climbers. Uh, they work under the supervision of the competent climber for a minimum of 90 days before they can be eligible to test up uh, and certify for a competent climber. And that's where we want all our workers is at that competent level. But we can't just stop now with the climber training and we can't uh, focus on just, uh, you know, our guys have PIM test training and in-grid C training and things like that. We now are moving into uh, – Companies that specialize in in more specific types of training, like capstan hoist, uh, gentle operations, hoist and uh, rigging, ten nineteen, competent rigger type training, things like that. Uh, RS is a uh, is a must, as well as OSHA ten, OSHA thirty. So the guys can really spend a lot of time, and the companies can spend a lot of money on training, and that is uh, that's the tough part is is training takes time and time is money. So um, it all comes back to them in the end because a properly trained workforce is an efficient workforce. Therefore, you should be more profitable as well. Yeah. But uh, sometimes the companies don't exactly see it that way. Well, let's uh, again, I'd like to stay on this this uh, tower climber class slide a little bit because there's some things on here that uh, I'm not as familiar with as I probably should be. I know one of our editors, Kelly Hill, went through a a tower climbing uh, training program, but uh, walk us through this 11 day program that you're at uh, this week in Colorado. Um, uh, you know, what are you doing for 11 days? They start out with um, basically a, uh, the first class is an introduction to the wireless industry, which walks them through the evolution of technologies as uh, we move into what we're talking about now, which would be 5G. Uh, gives them a basic overview. That's about an eight-hour day there. Then uh, they roll into OSHA 10-hour. From there, uh, first aid, CPR, bloodborne pathogens, and AED. Uh, then we get into workplace hazard awareness and hazard assessment. From there, they move into the authorized climber, which takes us about uh, about two and a half. Sometimes we roll into three days with, with uh, the Warriors for Wireless guys. A lot of these um, these guys take a little bit of extra time because some of them have never actually seen a, uh, a telecommunication site before. So we we take our time with these guys. Uh, from there, we roll into uh, capstan operation and hoisting and rigging. That takes another couple of days there. Uh, then we get into uh, grounding, lightning, and CAD welding, uh, exothermic welding technologies. Uh, that's a hands-on course. Uh, then do we go into RF and uh, electromagnetic energy? Uh, from there, we move on to the live environment uh, at the tower, and we spend a couple of days out there. We have rescue training uh, that happens, and usually ends up uh, with an LTE overview class mm -hmm. in the end, and then. Uh, uh, the graduation. So that usually takes about 11, 12 days by the time we're done. Wow. How many folks do you have going through the program this week? We've got 10 in the class this week. Uh, the W4W classes tend to be normally between 10 and 16, but they're really great, really great to work with these veterans. They're always top notch, top notch guys. And what's your relationship with W4W? Safety LMS is the exclusive training partner for Warriors for Wireless. Uh, I worked with Kelly Dunn uh, from the start uh, in our training program. They, they started out with uh, Aiken Technical College in, in, in Carolina and uh, really developed a good program there. And then we kind of took it uh, from that level to this 11-day class mm -hmm. uh, in the safety LMS part of the training. So, yeah, we're, we're really uh, – blessed to, to have been chosen for that role. Good. Well, um, uh, you know, staying on this theme of the existing programs, one of the things I've observed is that uh, when companies are recruiting for a, a, a tower crew, they typically have these greenhorns and then they have their the tower climber and the superintendent or the foreman. 
walk us through the, the typical crew that works on a tower. And then I want to segue into, um, uh, you know, some of the certifications that you're talking about in the future. But let, let's, let's walk us through a typical crew uh, that exists today. Well, let me, let me kind of give a historic background a little bit. Uh, when I first started in the industry, we really didn't have a certain classification of, of worker. You were the top hand, you were the green hand, you were the, the crew leader, whatever. Now we've got uh, you know a little better climber training with specifications on on what it takes. So each crew, and I'm just going to say um, you know basic LTE intended line crew would be three to four guys. Um, out of that, you've got to have a competent person, obviously, on the job site. So your crew leader normally would be that competent person, and he should be, uh, and I say should uh, be a guy that's five plus years in the industry, I would think. Uh, one of the one of the bad things that we have to work with is with the evolution of the new workforce constantly coming in, uh, we find that a dangerous trend that happens is guys get promoted too soon and they're really not uh, at the experience level to be really be running the crew. Uh, sometimes they hold their hand up too soon and get chosen. Sometimes they're just forced into that role. So we've got a crew leader there. He should have a second guy under him that would be, uh, we could call him the top hand. A lot of uh, a lot of crew leaders operate from the ground. A lot of crew leaders operate from the top of the tower. Uh, and then from that point, normally there's going to be two uh, lesser experienced guys that are working under the supervision of uh, the crew leader and that top hand. So that's kind of... Um, that's kind of an overview, I guess, of, of a basic tower crew these days. So the, the gap that I'm, I'm hearing and have been observing is there doesn't seem to be any correlation between these um, levels of, of, of crew members and the training that they might have had. And I would say a second gap that I'm seeing or hearing about is that you could have the crew leader who's been doing things a certain way, but frankly may not really know LT technology or may not know remote radio head fiber splice in the way they should. Uh, help me understand if you're seeing the same type of gaps. Yeah, I mean, the uh, there are companies out there that are fortunate enough to have had crews that have worked together for a long time. They know each other as brothers and sisters and can operate as a well-oiled team. And then there's other crews out there that uh, constantly are moving people around between crew to crew and that creates uh, a disconnect sometimes uh, with that exactly what you're saying there may be a person that's uh, being put into a role that they're expected to know a certain level of, uh, of technology that maybe they do not or maybe they are uh, a less experienced climber than than they are expected to be so that creates a, a dangerous situation, and sometimes uh, it also creates a situation of, of the crew not operating at its potential, therefore uh, not as profitable as it would be. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, um, uh, if I could get the guys to bring up the third slide, um, which gives an overview of what I would say the current uh, training solutions that are out in the market today, and JP, you mentioned to me the other day that uh, there really is three types of training. You've got third party training, you've got companies that offer training because they've been trained to train. And now you're seeing an evolution of uh, technical schools and other training groups. But we've got a slide up that has um, a summary of, of training solutions available. Why don't you walk us through, you know, where we are today and then we can talk a little bit about uh, TIRAP and uh, National Wireless Safety Alliance. Okay, Jeff, there, uh I can't, and obviously I can't see that slide, guys. So uh, there are a lot of good training companies out there that offer a, a lot of different solutions. Some of the top players, uh, you know, Gravitech's been around a long time, has an excellent program. Comtrain's been around a long time. Uh, Vertical Rescue Solutions, uh, Tom Woods and the guys over at PMI are great, great trainers. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, larger companies, Petzl and Capital Safety, the manufacturers have some really good programs as well. Uh, and then, like you said, there are uh, technical colleges and community colleges that are really offering some 
some good programs. Texas A&M uh, has a Cell 100 class that uh, is just about ready to hit the streets. And, um, you know, Aiken Tech has that class. There's a lot of different community colleges out there that uh, offer some pretty good uh, college-level accredited programs, uh, as well as these third-party trainers. And then uh, other companies that are, are large enough and have the, the bandwidth to create their own programs, such as uh, as Midwest Underground or Sabre, uh, they have an excellent program that they've developed for their guys in-house. Uh, Moss Tech, uh, Erickson is developing a, a really, really top-notch program right now, I understand. Uh, Gordon Lyman, the president of Safety LMS, has been consulting with Erickson in, in their development. So I think they're going to have a really top-notch program uh, hitting the streets pretty soon as well. Good. And then uh, you mentioned uh, where does Warriors for Wireless fit into kind of that 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 context of training off opportunities that you just went through? Yeah, I think uh, W4W's program kind of mirrors some of the uh, the technical college type uh, programs uh, being that's 11 days. Their, their Aiken Tech program is a little bit longer and, and uh, follows that protocol as well. So W4W is, um, is a program that is uh, really bringing a new type of worker into the workforce because these, uh, these men and women that are coming through this program have some qualities that are key to uh, safe operation in these environments. And one is they're used to working in a team environment. They understand watching each other's back and the importance of, of that over everything. And they're also used to uh, following direction and they're, they're really uh, keen on training. They, they're really good in the training environment. So uh, they're, they're going to bring uh, a higher level of, of work to the workforce, I believe. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, uh, talk a little bit about TIRAP and the National Wireless Safety Alliance. Um, in, in fourth quarter last year, I think PCIA and Department of Labor had a press release come out about TIRAP, uh, which is, I believe, stands for the Telecommunications Industry um, Apprentice Program. Uh, why don't you walk us through TIRAP and then walk us through uh, the NWSA? Yeah, both of the programs are, are excellent programs. The the, the main difference is the, the Department of Labor has endorsed the TIRAP program and uh, the NWSA is uh, private sector stuff. Basically, it is a credentialing uh, system to uh, set levels and standards of training so that we can better uh, understand and train our workforce. Uh, these guys will have a, a tested uh each one of them will test up to a certain level. So you'll start out with Tower Tech Level 1, that'll go to Tower Tech Level 2, and on to 3. And then in that will be subsets of things like Tower Stacking Foreman, Tower Modification Foreman. Then we'll get into broadcast and tall tower stuff. Uh, there's a lot of work in front of both programs. I would say uh, at this point, they're both moving uh, at, a, at a really, really good pace. But uh, there's still a ton of work to do in front uh, to get this thing rolling. Uh, the the main deal is is that we want these programs to mirror each other as, as close as possible, so that the workers themselves, uh, whatever company chooses to use whatever program, they will say, okay, uh, I'm going to buy into NWSA. So they will sign up for the program. The program is not. Uh, going to be mandatory or, you know, mandated in any way. It's a volunteer program, but the carriers will be the ones that will say, um, and they are on both sides of the house that they are, but they're going to buy into it and they will set, you know, a date or, or some type of, of protocol that says, you know, by this time we expect all of our crews to be NWSA trained or TIRAP trained. And then, those cards will need to be in those workers' hands. So uh, they will train at their own pace. And as they reach that level of training uh, on the NWSA side, they will go to an independent testing facility, uh, sit down in front of a computer. The computer will, uh, they'll dial up to our tech level one, whatever it is. 
uh, the computer will boot up and reach in there and grab, uh, you know, probably a uh, hundred questions out of uh, a cache of, you know, maybe five to 600 questions that, uh, we have developed through the program mm -hmm. and, uh, they will take that test and then they'll credential up to that level. They'll get that, that card. And on, on the, uh, on the tactile side, that will have to be done at the employer level and the employer will verify the ability to uh, that this person has reached this ability, or they can be a, a third party trainer involved that can, uh, can offer this training and test up to that level, or they can go to a community college type system and take the training and everything will be verified, but we're done. These guys are going to have a card in their, in their pocket that will say that they have in, in been involved and tested and certified to all these different levels. And mm -hmm. it will be an all encompassing type certification, not just a climber certification or not so much a safety oriented certification. Well, JP, one of the things that uh, frankly has surprised me is I've been spending the last four to five years in and around the tower industry is that the tower industry does not seem to have a, uh, as structured of a program in an apprentice program like the, you know, like the, like Dixie or the, the fiber optic uh, or electrician world has had for 25 years. Um, do you think the industry needs an apprentice type program and, and how does that tie into the tie wrap? I mean, will there be a formal apprenticeship that, that folks can go through? And if so, what, what's that going to look like? Yeah, Jeff, it, it, it will. Both NWSA and TIRAP it basically are offering that apprenticeship type program. Uh, that's why the different levels, the Tower Tech level one, two, three, uh, exist in that program. So uh, as far as our industry, you know, as big as we want to seem, we're, we're not. We're still a very small industry and a very tight industry. And I'm not exactly sure why. Uh, we have it developed a better program up to this point, uh, but it looks like, you know, we've got some changes in our future for the good. And uh, the TIRAP apprenticeship program and the NWSA are indicators that we've, we're doing things differently and we're doing things uh, more correctly than we ever have before. So hopefully uh, this is going to make a, a sweeping change in, in how we operate and how, how safe our environments are for our workers. Should be fine. It's just, um, do you remember where they left off on the script? Maybe you could ask. Hello. Did I lose you guys? Yeah, we lost Jeff Mucci, but uh, if you just want to continue what you're saying. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was finished there. So JP, can you hear me okay? There you are. Yes, sir. Uh, so I am now joined by audio. I lost my my connection. I've um, so where did you leave off in terms of uh, the apprenticeship and um, the industry gaps that you're seeing? Yeah, as I was saying, Jeff, I think that we're finally uh, reaching a point to where we're understanding the importance of apprenticeship programs. And uh, we're, we're going to start doing things better and differently than we ever have before. So uh, I think uh, the future in the next couple of years with uh, the NWSA and both the TIRAP programs are going to bring uh, our industry to a safer and more efficient workforce. And I believe uh, we're doing everything we can on both sides of the house. Uh, I've got uh, really dear friends working on both programs and 
And I can tell you that uh, every person that's involved in NWSA and TIRAP are uh, extremely dedicated to the projects and are taking climber safety uh, to the utmost uh, of importance. And um, I applaud all the people that are working on these programs because they are um, they're all volunteers and they, they put in hundreds if not thousands of hours uh, of hard work into these programs and development. So uh, I think we have a lot of good things coming in our future. Okay. Well, uh, let's kind of, let's close on some future trends that we're seeing. And um, again, what I've been, what I've been observing is you've got, you've got let me see make, if I can make sure an echo, an echo here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, you've got in building wireless, You've got base station hotels being developed. You've got these fiber deployments to pole tops. You have remote radio units going on rooftops and 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 and, and macro towers that are requiring fiber splicing at the um, you know on uh, on pole tops and and macro towers. Um, as you go through the tower climber one, two, and three, where do you see the the um, working on some of these new technologies like fiber splicing, where, where do you see those technologies fitting into the training? Both the NWSA and TIRAP programs are not uh, going to specifically uh, 100% focus on the tower work because we know we've got an evolution uh, coming. There's also different vertical columns of training uh, that are going to be added in the back end. Uh, there's a lot of technical training that's going to be added with uh, the, the folks at PCIA have indicated they're they're really um, going to be strong on on the RF side, uh, site right. act design, and uh, you know we're we're moving toward as we get into DAS and small cell, we're uh, we're moving you know away from tall tower environments, uh, meaning you know two three hundred feet. We're working in in LTE environments right now to uh, the environment where we're going to be working out of a lot of bucket trucks. We're going to be working on top of street lights and, and street signs and uh, low level type applications uh, in the, in the small cell world. So we're going to be training to different levels uh, to accommodate that network. So it's not going to be all, uh, all towers. anymore. So do you see again, the designations of tower uh, climber one, two, and three, including the the small tower and uh, bucket truck type training. I believe that will be a another uh, column of training, so to speak. That will be mm -hmm. uh, you know endorsements or classifications on their own. There's going to be a lot more aerial lift type applications uh, as we move into those technologies. So I would I would uh, see that both NWSA and TIRAP are going to be including those types of training. Uh, as part of their programs. And how about fiber splicing? Uh, you got guys that now have to climb towers with fiber splicing kits. Um, is that part of the existing, say the 11 doing this week, are they getting training on, on fiber splicing? They will probably get that. The W4W program has, does not include that yet. Uh, we are looking into that uh, as an additional uh, type of training but the employers uh, individually, depending on what types of technology they work on, will be uh, administering those OEM type programs uh, themselves. Uh, the good thing is these days, uh, fiber splicing is made much easier with quick fiber connectors and things like that, yeah. that uh, make the training easier. So yes, it is a technology that, that uh, these young men and women are, are gonna be required to have. Good. Well, listen, I know I appreciate your time. I know you you made time for us today while you're at a, a training session. It, it's uh, always good to have you on the show. Uh, safe travels back to Austin. I hope you can join us. I think next week we're hosting the Texas uh, State Wireless Association uh, at the RCR ATX Studio Lounge in Austin. Are you, uh, hopefully you can make it by. I think it's on the 23rd. Um, Wouldn't miss it for the world, Jess. I'll be there for sure. <laughs> well, listen, we appreciate everybody watching today. Uh, this episode of inside the helicopters on tower climbing we had one of the, the top experts in the industry john, uh, jp jones join us next week we're going to be looking at outside plant specifically uh fiber optic splicing and how uh folks are trained to work 
uh, in confined space. And uh, over the coming week, we'll keep tabs on JP and Ty Rapp and the National uh, Wireless Alliance uh, Safety Program. JP, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a great day. Bye. You too. Bye. Inside Telecom Careers is a production of RCR TV News. To reach Jeff Mucci or to suggest a show topic for Inside Telecom Careers, you can reach him at jmucci at rcrwireless.com. For all telecom-related news and information, please visit rcrwireless.com. To connect with the industry's top talent, please visit telecomcareers.net.